All right, good afternoon. It is the 24th day of November in the Lord's year 2015. I'm J. Michael McCoy, and welcome to another edition of Max World Live here on 99.3 KTIA. Coming up next hour, Tom Coates from Consumer Credit of Des Moines and Will Rogers, the co-chair of the Polk County Republicans, <clears throat> excuse me, will come in the show, on the show, with the show, and talk to us a little bit about what's uh, going on since the last presidential forum which the family leader had here a few uh, nights ago and how the picture is changing in the state of iowa did jindal backing out make a big difference who's next to back out and what about the surge from ted cruz now ahead of ben carson that'll be the conversation this afternoon three o'clock i'm sorry four o'clock right here on the truth uh, 99.3 all right let's cover some local news chris roloff here also frank uh in the studio well, no, Frank's in the production. Well, you can tell Frank's producing because the front of the show was messed up. Ryan would never mess that up. But, you know, when I didn't get my call me, call me, call me, call the J. Michael McCoy. I'm, we didn't have any of that. Why'd you screw it up, Frank? And you missed that, too, didn't you? Yeah. Why'd you screw it up? Uh, it, it's, it's supposed to be automated and something didn't automate. See, it's always somebody else's fault with Frank. He's a low information blamer. All right. Um, huh. I mean, I don't even want to get to the big story of the day because I'm afraid that, Chris, you and I are going to remember this day. But I'm going to open the phone lines wide open because I need some other people's opinion. I have a very, very strong opinion on what President Obama, Putin, Syria, Turkey, NATO, and all the other players in the world are going through right now. They are talking about declaring war on Syria and ISIS. Now, of course, the challenge with that is, is Syria is backed by America. ISIS is or is not a part of Syria, depending on who you want to talk about. I mean, the Middle East has always been a cluster. I mean, it's just all these different people. It's, it's all revolutionary war. Shiites, Sunnis, Islamists, Muslim. It's just, it's a messed up deal. I'm thankful that I have Jesus. I'm thankful that I have a book that I can go to that tells me everything's going to be okay. No matter how bad man messes up, everything's still going to be okay. Does it give you a little more peace being a born-again Christian today, being a follower of Jesus Christ, knowing that what all these yahoos are doing in our name with our tax dollars won't make a, a bit of difference in the end because there is no end? All right, so let me see if I can uh, run this down. I've been glued to uh, AP and Reuters uh, for the last couple of hours trying to figure out exactly what happened. Apparently, this morning, a Russian uh, air fighter jet flew over Turkey's airspace. <clears throat> you know how airspace works. If you take a border and just go up 50,000 feet, that's airspace. And they had been apparently warned, Turkey had warned them before, Quit flying over our airspace. Turkey is not an ally of Russia. We are, without Russia, I'm sorry, without Turkey in the Middle East, we'd be, well, a dead Turkey. They provide us with great friendship, great, well, they're, they're our ally. A word that I'm afraid we're going to become much more used to as they did in the late 30s and early 40s in this country and the teens in the early 20s, ally. I looked up the definition of ally and there was this one and there was this one and then there was this one and then there was this one. Friend over foe. I like that. Ally. You're my friend over my foe. So the Russian jet apparently flew over Turkey's airspace it has not been confirmed yet but there was apparently some radio communication between the turkish government and the russian jet 
basically telling them, please go back to your side. You are in our airspace. The jet came back again a second time into Turkey airspace. And Turkey shot it down. Then, as a Russian helicopter was going to retrieve or hopefully save the lives of the jettisoned pilots, because they did jettison, that helicopter was destroyed by a Syrian bomb, a uh, over-the-shoulder bomb, a missile, made by, supplied by the good old U.S. of A. That's right, made in the U.S.A. Because we have somehow picked the enemy of our enemy to be our friend. Bashar Assad, who is currently in charge of Syria, who is, I mean, how can I compare this to you? Um, remember the cartoon Tom and Jerry when we were growing up and Tom was the cat? And, and, and Tom was in charge of Jerry's safety. Yeah, we trust Syria's Assad to be our friend and our ally. So now you have NATO gathering this afternoon, tomorrow, to decide whether they're going to throw down the gauntlet, the Fifth Amendment, or the Fifth Article, as it's called in NATO. And that is when one country has been attacked, which right now we have two, France and Turkey. When we have two countries that have been attacked, we can say, okay, it's dogpile time and everybody has to get in. And the rules of NATO is everybody has to get in. You don't get to sit on the sideline because you've made the mistake, President Barack Hussein Obama, of making... Our enemy's enemy, our friend. Is this making sense to you? Because I'm, I'm, I'm doing the best I can. I really am. I'm trying to keep it simple because I can't even hardly understand it with all these friends and enemies and allies and Assad's and Ashames and tickets and bombs and Russia and Putin and... Oh, yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. Then, then there's Obama. I am getting better on my cough, Chris. No, you sound a lot better. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm trying to track on this stuff, too, because um, like many folks my age, I think um, I possibly have put my head in the sand in some ways and also um, am led by emotions and rhetoric uh, and quick decisions and quick responses. Um, but this is this is not a very happy. This is not very happy news. Uh, if I understand what you're saying correctly, uh, Mac, Turkey and Russia were allies. Is that correct? At one point, yes. Um, was that like up until yesterday kind of thing? That was up until Obama. So what? how has Obama uh, damaged, the? to your understanding, how has Obama damaged the relationship between Turkey and Russia? Well, Obama, oh, we, need, we need Turkey. We need yeah. Turkey bad. <laughs> and Obama has kind of thrown Putin under the bus a couple of times sure. over the last yep. few years. Yep. And Turkey said, you're going to make me choose who to be friends with, this friend or that friend? You're both my friends. Right. And then we chose, Frank, phone's ringing. We chose to back Assad, which I, I, I don't know what's right there. I mean, I think I know what's right, but somebody else could tell me differently. I might, might agree. I might not agree. But Assad was his his Muslim Brotherhood. I mean, he's the enemy of our enemy. Nobody likes Assad. But Obama chose to be allies with Assad, and Putin went, "What? What? What? What are you? What are you doing?" And and the Middle East, because here, let me let me back up a little bit. It used to be that. Iran and America actually got along pretty good, especially after, you know, the, the hostages for 444 days. Yeah. They came home, you know, back in 1980, 81. Um, 
Iran is and America have actually done pretty well. Now, Iraq, not so good. Right. But see, the problem in the Middle East is about every third president jumps ship. I mean, the weapons that ISIS is using on our allies is American equipment left behind when we said, we're out of here, Jackson. You know, President Obama seven years ago promised that he would get us out of the war in Iraq. Stupidest thing in the whole wide world he could have done. But he had to please all his low information voters because war is bad, right? We can kill unborn babies by the millions, but war is bad. He has alienated Israel, who is our true ally. He has given Russia a foothold in Turkey, Syria, Iraq, Iran, Jordan, and Saudi Arabia are just madder than heck at Mr. Obama because he's just tossed all the popcorn up in the air and said, well, let's see who lands. We'll pick you as a friend. No, no, no. We'll pick you as a friend. No, no, no. So um, it, it's just a mess over there. But now we've got NATO thinking about declaring war. And NATO was built on the fact that if one decided, they all had to go. I've got Army Brad on the phone. We'll talk to him in just a second. I've also got some very interesting local news I want to share with you. And then next hour, Tom Coates and Will Rogers here live on The Truth. Credit cards are like grandkids. They love you. Sometimes get out of control, and it's fun to get a new one. Who can stop them from piling on? Hi, I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of Des Moines. At the end of the day, you can give these grandkids back, but you're stuck paying off bad credit card debt. We can help you put the fun back into using credit cards responsibly. Right, kids? Yeah! If you need help getting credit cards off your back, call Consumer Credit of Des Moines. All right, 21 minutes after the hour, 3 o'clock, 24th day of November. 
in the Lord's year uh, 2015. I'm J. Michael McCoy. I, I think, should we retire him as producer? Well, you know, he's helpful. He is? You know, willing hands. When? Today, he's a servant. He's there. He's available. I don't have to do it. You don't have to do it. I'd rather do it. Yeah. I'd rather do it. But you have to do all this cool. You have to know all this cool stuff. Well, I don't know if I know all the cool stuff or not. Let's get Brad in here. Brad is a uh, my, my, my buddy, Army Brad, and I call him Army Brad because Brad's been in the Army for how long, Brad? 20-some years. 30 years when I retired. 30 years when he retired. I called Brad earlier this morning, and I said, can you make sense of what's going on? And so I'm assuming he's either calling in to say no, <laughs> or he's made some, some sense out of it. Brad, give me the best you got. Well, well, Mac, you were saying some stuff that was, is just factually incorrect. Okay, good. Correct me. Well, Syria and Russia have long time been allies. Um, yes. The Russians and the Turks have been at each other's, or been a, opposed to each other before there was a Turkey and before there was a, a Russia. Um, for, I mean, with, we're, the Turkish-Russian animosity goes all the way back to the Byzantine Empire, and they've they've been fighting for for twice or three times longer than there's even been a United States. So the fact that the the, the Russians were going to push the limits with the the Turks was was a bad call on the Russians, but it's probably a, a was a bad idea for the the Turks to to shoot them down. But if you have that much um, history, it, it doesn't surprise me really. Um, the, the mess in Syria um, is nothing else you can call it other than a mess because um, when the the Russians came in, they were supposed supposed to, according to what the United States was hoping, is, was they were going to start going after the um, ISIS, ISIL, Daesh, whatever you want to call them. But in reality, what they did is they started bombing along with ISIL, but they also started bombing the, the, the people we put our you know, pile of uh, chips on. and Which is Assad. No, the Russians are all in with Assad. That is their man. They want to keep him. Um, when they saw that there was a vacuum, that the United States was not really going to go in and, and try to put him down, they were willing to su- try to prop him up. But but we we wanted we wanted two things. We wanted Assad gone and ISIL gone, and that that's probably not a wise thing to do because the two are uh, at um, opposition to each other. We were trying to only support people that were willing to go after only ISIL. See, it's, it's you know, you got a, a civil war, a true civil war, where you got really not just even three groups. You have 20 and 30 groups that are moving around, making alliances to fight with each other against the one that they're most worried about. And we could not, we literally spent millions of dollars to get like four or five fighters on our side, not units, but people that were eventually, I, mean, I would go pay over there and fight for, for the amount of money that we're spending to get, get these handful of troops because they wanted to, it's kind of like if, uh, if there's a civil war, they wanted to take Assad out. We didn't want to support anybody that wasn't just going to go after ISIL. Of course, Nobody's going to do that because ISIL is the second threat. Assad is who they were actually started the civil war against. So it's a giant mess. And then the Russians came in, propped up Assad. There's no way he's leaving as long as the military support is there from Russia. But aren't we also militarily supporting Assad? No. Well, you know what? Who knows what we really are doing? Because I don't think even we know what we're doing. We probably are actually secondhand supporting him. Yeah. Because there's there's no clear set line of what we are doing, and what we're not doing. That's the the biggest problem. Is if if there's not if we are not going to be in the lead, then there, it's not the Soviet Union anymore with Russia. Russia is, is only able to step in because there's a vacuum and there's a power vacuum where they can fill it. All right. Well, Brad, I appreciate you calling and 
trying to explain that to me. Did, did that, does that make sense to you, Mac? No. Do you understand it? Well, <laughs> I'm completely lost. <laughs> well, I think Brad, you know, and to, you I think know, Brad did a good job. No, you I'm did still a good completely job. Lost. It's a conf- it's a confusing situation, and, and one and Brad and, and Mac, I know you probably want to move on. There's some local news we want to talk about, but it is really not just a civil war uh, in the way that we think about it. Is it very clear cut, easy to understand? But you've got really lots of tribal people at war with one another in a very small, close knit region. Um, and I, and, and you have not decades, but centuries, centuries, right? Of animosity. Right. You have Turks, you have Kurds, you have Syrians, you have Arabs, you have Christians, you have um, Sunni, and um, all all the different you know branches of of Islam. And the the one good thing from an American standpoint is they hate each other more than they really hate us. We're like the third or fourth people down the line. List. They, they would rather go after the person that they've had, you know, four centuries of animosity that's living across the street than having to actually cross the Atlantic Ocean. And, and while they want to, you know, hey, yes, I want to attack the United States, I'm more concerned about the guy living down the block because his grandfather killed my grandfather because my yeah. great grandfather killed his great grandfather, and and it goes way back. And there's a lot of lot of history that. We don't even understand because it's longer and more ingrained than our than our country even has the time to understand. Well, Brad, thank you very much for no taking problem. the time to uh, inform us, and uh, thank you for listening. I love you, brother. Hope to see you soon. You too, bud. Well, I'm still confused. It's a crazy it's a crazy situation over there, Mac, and and one that. Uh, um, I mean, it just it, it just reminds me of the the Hatfields and the McCoys and the you know um, when he was saying that my grandpa uh, shot my grandpa who hate this you know it's just a it's just a long running history of hate and anger uh, and as we said on previous programs just because you give somebody a Big Mac and a Starbucks cup of coffee and let them shop at Target the hate doesn't go away. Well, and and you you you. Wh- wh- why are we over there? Why are we over there? Frankly, Mac, I have no idea. Okay. Uh, it's about something that's made. Uh, uh, your shirt has some in it. And uh, your uh, food, you had McDonald's today, and you had that little styrofoam pack because yeah. of that. And it's because of uh, the tires on our cars. And uh, the way we go down the road, it's oil. Fossil fuel. For the last 115 years, we have decided that oil is a part of everything. And yet we don't produce much of it. But we could. Oh, we could. We could. Now, don't tell that to the Iowa farmers that, want, that don't want some of their land taken so the pipeline can go across to Iowa so we can get it down to a refinery. Don't tell that to the tree huggers who say one oil spill, we're, we're going to ruin half of Iowa. And you know what? They're not wrong. But at, at some point or another, you, you've, got, you've got blood, American blood. You've got Middle East oil and all the comforts that comes with it. Do you realize that oil is less than $50 a barrel? And six years ago, at this very time, we were approaching $5 a gallon gas because oil was at 100 and some dollars. Now, what changes oil by 50%? You know the answer to that? One word starts with a P, politics. It doesn't cost any more to bring the oil out of the ground today than it did 100 years ago or whatever, 20 years ago. It's oil. Now, in this country, if we would just have a president, any president, I don't care who he's with. If Obama did it, honest to heavens, the guy would gain major points with me. Say we are no longer going to have fossil fuel driven automobiles in the year 2020 or whatever it is. It can't be 2016, but five years, we're going to eliminate it. You've got the electric car manufacturers right up there. You've got every major, you know, who really developed these powerful batteries? Do you think it was everybody in the bunny? No, it was NASA. It was American ingenuity that developed these incredible power sources that would take a rocket ship to the moon and back, or quite frankly, to Mars. That little guy that went on Mars, that's all batteries. We have 
Uh, what, what was it? The $6 million man? We have the technology. <laughs> we can build it. But the oil um, companies and their lobbyists are so powerful. I mean, Chris, you would die if you knew how much money was pumped into every single senator and congressman's pocket in some way or another. And it comes from oil. Even our good Senator Grassley, who I love deeply, he's a wonderful man. Somewhere down the line, some money that he's getting somewhere comes from oil. Yes, Frank. Hillary mentioned in the 08 campaign that the collective oil companies had generated a gross profit of $680 billion uh, on fossil fuel. But according to what I heard, the government collected taxes to the tune of $1.3 trillion on that same oil. So does the government have any interest in seeing fossil fuel go away? when they're generating that kind of tax dollars on the product. There's another point. There, there's another point. Everybody's got their hand in the oil dipper. Now, do we need oil? Yeah, we do. We do need oil. We do need oil. Um, fossil fuel, like I said, it's, it's in your shirt. It's in my shirt. It's in my watch. It's, it's everywhere. But that's drops compared to what we burn up in a combustion engine. I mean, it's just foolish what we burn up in a combustion engine. We don't need it. We don't have to have it. Um, do you travel to Omaha ever, Chris? I have a couple of times, yeah. The wind meals, the oh, wind yeah. turbines. Absolutely. That's all mid-America. That's all our good friend um, out of Omaha, Warren Buffett. Now, you think that guy's smart? He's the guy that owns all those wind meals. They're not wind meals, the wind turbines. Turbines, yeah. Tesla, a car manufacturer, um, could drop... A million cars into this country in the matter of 36 months if the government would allow it to do that. But the EPA uh, somehow finds that these batteries are very dangerous if you don't dispose of them in the right place. Well, so is the battery in the back of your Honda. It's greed. It's money. It's, it, and it, it, it's on our backs. We're the ones that pay the price. We are, we are the slaves to our government. We are no longer for the people, by the people. We are the slaves to our government. It's sad. All right. We're going to take a break. When we come back, Des Moines news, including, did you hear? The curse of the cover could be back. The curse of the cover. Could it be the downfall of a perfect season for the Iowa Hawkeyes? It's happened once before. Does it, will it happen again? We'll talk about that. And obviously, the tragic death of a Des Moines woman, 22 years old, leaves four children behind with not a father in the picture to care for them. Four orphans immediately at 9 o'clock yesterday morning in Des Moines. Also, another big murder, and it's finally going to open. The walkie exit off of I-80-35 will be opening here in the next few uh, next few hours, I believe. No, I'm sorry. It'll open at noon on December 1st. And uh, what a great thing that is for our community. We're coming back live here on The Truth 99.3. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. I'm Brian Leach, owner of Service Legends, and my position is Chief Talent Officer. I'm Nicholas Wonderscheid. I am Bernie Hobbs. And I'm the Service Manager. Marketing Director and Client Relations Manager. Everything that we do is about ensuring that we exceed your expectations. Our clients are important to us. 100% satisfaction. We're not just focused on heating and cooling. That's the easiest part of our job, actually, is fixing furnaces and air conditioners. Everyone that we come in touch with, we want to improve lives. Bottom line is, we've got our installation guarantees, 25% energy savings guarantee, comfort guarantee, temperature selection guarantee, property protection guarantee. 100% satisfaction guaranteed, fixed rate or it's free. All of those guarantees are backed up with a 100% money back guarantee to hold ourselves accountable to making sure that you get what you're after. Just fixing the problem today, if they have another problem five days down the road, it's still a fixed rate or it's free. We use what's called straightforward pricing. Our technicians are gonna give you an exact to the penny price on what it's gonna take before they move forward with any repair. That way you know what to expect. It's the same price every day. No surprises. If you get off work at five o'clock in the afternoon, 
you come home, you realize that, oh, my furnace is broken. Now you need to call somebody out that night. You shouldn't have to pay more for that. We're guaranteeing service 24-7. We run afternoons, evenings, nights, weekends. We're staffed to work that. Phone rings at 3 in the morning. You'll get one of our representatives answering the phone every time. We're not sending you out to Timbuktu in some call center. It's our service legend team members, our mission control team. I'll take a call anytime. And then they answer the phones the same way during the day as they do at night. It's a great day at your service company. How can we make you smile? That's the only way to provide true 24-hour service. When you're able to let somebody actually live in their home safely when they weren't able to do that before, where they don't have to stay up at night and worry about is the heat going to come back on? Are we going to freeze the pipes? Is the baby in the room next door going to be sick because they got too cold? When you're able to help somebody overcome challenges like that, that's impacting a life. That makes a difference. I get goosebumps thinking about it. I love the team. I love the people that I work with. <laughs> we have fun, but we work hard. I call them my ambassadors of legendary service. If you could just envision what that is, that's who we're sending to your home. They literally will call in, pick up the phone and call and say, hey, I want to talk to your manager. And I get on the phone, they're like, that technician that was at my house was the greatest technician ever. That's cool to me. We want to brighten people's days. Every person that we have going into the house has gone through an extensive background check. Drug testing, we have a very thorough interview process that one out of 140 people make it through. If we promise you something, that's what you're going to get, no matter what. We're here when you need us to protect the safety and comfort of your family. If you're not happy, we're going to make it right. If we're willing to put 100% money back guarantee on what we do, what type of work do you think we do? Give us a call. We're there for you 24-7, 365 days a year. Enough said. All right, 22 minutes before the top of the hour, 3.38 here on this 24th day of uh, November. Just two days away from Thanksgiving. Christmas is one month away. Man, that just caught up with us quickly, didn't it? It just seemed like yesterday. It just seemed like yesterday. My wife and I were sitting on the backyard of Schmidt's house watching Fourth of July fireworks. It just seems like yesterday that we were planning on going to visit mom in Platte, South Dakota for her birthday on the 12th of December. And now she's dead. It just seems like yesterday that I had three grandkids and now I've got six. Where does time go? I'm so thankful for my relationship with Jesus. Before this type of stuff going on in the world would have sent me to the moon because I would have thought somehow I needed to, I needed to control it. I needed to put my arm around it. It's me that needed to be in the middle of all of this chaos. I need to be protecting my children and my grandchildren and my wife and my businesses and everything else that was going on. And I, 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 and then a little, a little less than five years ago, Jesus came to me in the middle of the night and said, you're mine. Uh, if you've ever read my blog or my testimony, it's on my website at MacMcCoy.com, M-A-C-M-C-K-O-Y.com. It's an easy read. It's about a two font, but it's an easy read. One page. Huh. And if you look under blogs, it's called Mug by Jesus. And basically in the middle of the night, Jesus came and said to me those horrible, horrible, horrible words. That as a God guy, because I was a God guy for 50 years, as a God guy, I never wanted to believe that one Bible verse, that one Bible verse could be true. After all the good things I did, after all the times I went to church and on Sundays and gave my money, a little jingle in the jar and served on the pancake feed. And I was once on the building committee and, and I had to fire a, a priest once in my church. I mean, after all the things I had done, certainly that one little Bible verse would not keep me from an eternity with my God. That one verse, nobody gets to the Father but through me. And in the middle of the night, on the 20th of July, 2011, 
I had a dream or a vision or I don't care what you want to call it. It doesn't matter to me. I know what it was. Moments later, I was awakened by my dog barking at me in a, in a horrible shrivel. I was apparently screaming at the top of my lungs because I had had a dream while running to the light, running to my father, God, running for an eternity. Jesus stepped in between me and his father shook his finger at me three times and said, I don't know you. <clears throat> so the next day I got on the phone and I started calling the pastors that I know. I called in the, I called in all the favors, you know what I mean? And I sat with them and I begged them. That doesn't mean what I think it does, does it? That doesn't, that's not right, right? I'm a God guy. What do I, what do I need with the son when I've got the father? Why do, why do I need the son? Christians are weird. They're goofy. They're soft. They're a bunch of wussies. Oh, the answer is love. Just love. Turn the other cheek. Love, 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 love. That wasn't. That wasn't how I was raised. I was raised with cowboy justice. You strike my cheek, you better run. Tell me, pastor, priest, rabbi, tell me that that can't be so. That the only way to my father is through Jesus. I love all my pastors and priests and rabbis and nuns and friends but not one of them, honestly, could look at me and say, ah, you're okay, Mac. You don't need Jesus. Even the rabbis that I knew said, well, Mac, I think you probably need Jesus. So I prayed. I prayed like you would pray over a dying baby. I prayed it over and over and over. God Please give me a relationship with your son, Jesus. God, please give me a relationship with your son, Jesus. God, please. You got the idea. It was the last thing I thought of when I went to sleep. And it was the first thing on my mind when I woke up. And if my mouth wasn't making a noise like it is now, we call them words and speech. Inside, my head was thinking, God, please give me a relationship with your son, Jesus. And then on August 8th, a little after 6 in the morning, it happened. And I've never been the same again. Never. So luckily, with all the war and the hate and everything that's going on around the world, I don't have to worry about it. I don't really care if I completely understand it. And I, I, I sincerely apologize to you if you think that my job sitting in this chair should be able to to explain that to you, I'm sorry. I can't. I tried, and I still can't. I don't get it. I called my buddy Chuck Larson today, and I said, Chuck, explain it to me. And he says, nobody can. Nobody can. It's moving faster than anybody can explain it. But as Chuck reminded me, you and Jesus are still okay, right, Mac? Yeah, buddy, we're good. Then you're going to be all right. Then it doesn't matter who dies, who wins, who lives, who gets to yell victory or who goes down with the ship? Because those ships and those victories are all made of flesh. And in the end, our Lord and Savior Jesus will lift us up. The true warriors, the true warriors for the God Almighty that he is. Jesus will lift us up and he will bring us home. And I don't know if we'll remember any of this or not. I don't know if we'll remember this president or that president or this war or that war. I don't know. I, it's a mystery to me. But I do know that there will be no sadness. There will be no tears. There will only be joy in the arms of my father. And I never, ever, ever knew that until just a few years ago. So if you've got friends out there, if you've got children out there, 
If you've got a brother or a sister or a wife and they just haven't got it yet, there's nothing you can do, brother. I went to church every Sunday. I asked pastors and priests on the radio every time I got a chance. I don't get this Jesus thing. I don't get this Jesus. Why do I need Jesus for? I don't need no stinking Jesus. I've got God. Nobody. Nobody got through my thick skull until the hound of heaven came along and said, you're mine, Mac. You're mine. I planned it from the time before you were ever born. I know what you are, who you are, and what you're going to do for me. Not yourself. Not a company. Not a business. Not a community. I'm sorry, Mac, Jesus says. I'll name no streets after you. I'll name no buildings after you. I'll give you no great rewards on earth. In fact, I'm going to send you to a church to worship me in a place where they won't even recognize you, Mac, if you buy an organ or a window or a cup. Mac, here's your mission. It's simple. Talk to me like I'm a six-year-old, I said. God, talk to me. He said, here's your mission. Honor God, follow Jesus, and serve others. So, we continue on. It is a Tuesday afternoon, the 24th day of November in the Lord's year 2015. When we come back, some local stories. Next hour, Tom Coates and Will Rogers will talk about the politics surrounding the politics in Iowa here live on The Truth 99.3 Credit cards are like grandkids. They love you. Sometimes get out of control, and it's fun to get a new one. Who can stop them from piling on? Hi, I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of Des Moines. At the end of the day, you can return the grandkids, but you're stuck paying off bad credit card debt. We'll help you put the fun back into using credit cards responsibly. Right, kids? Yeah! If you need help getting credit cards off your back, call Consumer Credit of Des Moines. Hi, my name is David Burrier, your Hope Coach. I host a live weekly talk show called I've Been There every Thursday afternoon at 5.30 right here on webcast1live.com and on my weekly radio program Saturday mornings at 10 on Truth Network 99.3 FM. I interview common everyday people who have survived incredible life challenges and who testify to God's faithfulness in the midst of their storms. So join me as we bring a message of hope and encouragement. Everybody needs hope. I know because I've been there. Whether you're 10, 25, 50, 80 years old and beyond, everyone needs to live within their means. I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of America. For almost a quarter of a century, we've helped people of all ages learn to manage their personal finances to benefit them far into the future. When problems arise, we've got the experience you need to make those debt problems go away. Got financial problems? Call Consumer Credit of America. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. All right, 10 before the top, Salem Radio Network News at the top of the hour. Chris Roloff in studio right now. You know, we were just talking about off, off uh, microphone a little bit. Um, I didn't plan that testimony I just gave you. Uh, there, it's not in my notes. It's nowhere. That came from this very, very soft, comfortable, patient, peaceful, serene guy that Jesus makes me. Because here I'm trying to explain to my audience, which used to, I got to tell you something. It used to be very, very important to me that I would be able to explain difficult political situations to you. I would write them out and write them out and write them out and edit it and erase and back scratch and, and paste and copy. And I don't know. I just had a piece. They said, Mac, you ought to really tell people what's important on the radio. It isn't who Assad's on and Russia did this and Turkey shot down that. And I know it has an impact and I'm going to get better at understanding it. I'm going to try. 
But the thing that I was overcome with was, here's what I do know. That Jesus saved my life. And I was a schmuck. I was not a very good man. And nobody could tell me that except Jesus. Frank, what do you want? Do you have that peace that passeth understanding? Pass that keepeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of the Son, Jesus Christ? Yeah. All right. There are four little kids, all under the age of four, who don't have a mother or a father this morning. Because yesterday, she was riding in a car that got annihilated in an accident, and she died. Her name is Karen Dameron. Um, that's the niece. Uh, she can't, or that's the aunt. She can't believe that her niece is gone. 22 year old Scalicity Perez also goes by the last name of Boyd. She's got four little babies that are left behind, all fatherless. One's in jail for 65 years, uh, one's out of the picture, and the other ones, they don't know who they are. 22 year old girl with four children who are now dead. She's dead. And the aunt and the family has to live on to figure out why. The police think it has something to do with a murder at a nightclub a couple weeks ago, that it is a revenge killing on the streets of Des Moines. A revenge killing. Dateline, Des Moines, Iowa. The heartland, a place people come to grow, a place people don't have to unlock their doors at night. They can just leave them open, a place where neighbors know neighbors, a place where we still put our sheets out on the clothesline to have that fresh country smell. Dateline, Iowa, a revenge killing, leaves a mother of four dead and four babies orphaned. Dateline, Iowa. All right, so Friday's the big game. Did you know there's a big game on Friday, Chris? I heard about that. That's <clears throat> that football thing, right? Yep. Actually, I think Saturday is the big game, too, because that's Rhodes' last game. Oh, yeah. yeah that's that's going to be sad. It is. It's going to be an emotional day. Now, on Dan McCarney's last day, many years ago, when he won his last game, and Jamie Pollard let him stay. By the way, that just shows you that Jamie Pollard, for whatever you may say about him, he's a class act. He lets the coach finish the season. They carry Dan McCarney off the field in hero status. Wow. I hope they do that with Paul Rhodes. I, you know, I would imagine they would. Um, but it's big news. You know, it's big news. Everybody wants to know who the next coach of the Iowa State Cyclones would be. And I'm going to tell you right now, I know who it is. It's Mike Ditka. <laughs> Mike Ditka is going to come out of retirement. We are going to have to do one little thing. It's going to be called... Ditka's Cyclones rather than Iowa State Cyclones. But that's minor. <laughs> minor. That's minor. Small little thing. Absolutely not a big deal. Right. Ditka's Cyclones. And you know what their nickname's going to be? The Bears. <laughs> no, no. Who, who's the cy- little Cyclones? No, it'll be the Bears. So start the rumor. Get it on Facebook. Mike Ditka was seen outside of Jamie Pollard's office today. No, no. Let's make it better. Um... Mike Ditka was seen having lunch at Applebee's with Mike Ditka in Des Moines. And it is rumored that they've already offered him a contract to coach the Iowa State Ditkas. Or Ditkas Iowa State Cyclones. There we go. All right. um, So here's what happened. In 2009... When Iowa's Daryl Johnson appeared on the front cover of Sports Illustrated, the title was still perfect because that year they were undefeated until three days later and Iowa State lost to Northwestern after it had been distributed. Today, Sports Illustrated on their November 30th issue is featuring the Iowa Hawkeye football team. The 11-0 Hawkeyes take on the Nebraska Cornhuskers Friday in the Heroes game, which is the last of the regular season. Then Iowa has earned a trip to the Big Ten Championship game in Indianapolis on December 5th. Now, will this be the curse of the cover? Will it return? I've talked to Hawkeye fans. I mean, Nebraska is terrible this year. I, I think we've won four, maybe five 
And I, I, we only won one really good game. The rest of them we played, you know. I, mean, I, I think Dowling could honestly beat Nebraska right now. You know, Dowling's state champion. Was there wins at home or on the road? I don't know. I, I, they lost a lot on, at home. <clears throat> Dowling won the state championship this week. I think Dowling could beat Nebraska. <clears throat> but the bottom line, 230 on ABC – Friday afternoon, the game will be played. And should, should Nebraska beat Iowa, we'll just call it the curse of the cover. Now, I don't know if I've publicly said this on the radio yet, but I will now because I've only got today and tomorrow. I am a ferocious Nebraska fan. Anybody who knows me knows that. Graduate, grew up there, graduated from there. My family was in the automobile business. That was one of our businesses, and we gave a a car to the coach and the athletic director every year to drive. It was not unusual for my mom to uh, tell me when I walked in from school uh, on a Wednesday afternoon, honey, wash your hands. We've got company for dinner. And an hour later would be Bob Osborne, uh, or Tom Osborne, and Bob Devaney in my living room. So I am a ferocious Nebraska fan. I am an arrogant pompous Nebraska fan. I even owned the Nebraska night or uh, uh, a sports bar here in town that was for the Nebraska Cornhuskers. That my good friends, the Hawkeyes, wouldn't even come in and eat there because there was a big N on the wall and I didn't care. But I want to say this right now. Iowa, I hope you win. I really want Iowa to win. I want you to be undefeated. I want you to have a perfect season. And I want the spoils to be left on the sidelines. Nebraska doesn't deserve to beat an undefeated Hawkeye team. Should Nebraska win, I will go back to being my pompous, arrogant self. But for right now, mark it down. It has never been said by this cowboy before. I hope this Friday, the Heroes game, when Nebraska takes on Iowa at Memorial Coliseum in Lincoln, I hope the Hawkeyes walk away victorious. Will Rogers, Tom Coates next, the presidential elections here live on The Truth.